Hey everyone, thanks for joining me again. Today we're going to continue on with our discussion through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 20. Now this is the part where Jesus compares his people to salt and light and where Jesus makes those sort of troubling statements about whether or not people should keep the law. Last week, we talked about the Beatitudes and how those are not so much virtues to be attained as much as they are descriptions of the kinds of people that Jesus is bringing into his kingdom. So these types of people are normally the kinds of people that are ostracized or put on the margins of society, but it's these very people that Jesus wants to bring into the very center of his kingdom. Now, let's just jump right in. So when Jesus talks about his people as salt, I think he has two ideas in mind, flavor and preservation. Um, with flavor, I think that what Jesus is saying is that when his people embody the Sermon on the Mount, we actually make the planet and I think we make the human race acceptable to God. I think we make the planet and the human race as something that's enjoyable to the Father. Salt was used in sacrifices and I think that what Jesus is communicating is that we, like salt on the earth, make the earth something that can be offered to God as a praise offering, um, as something that brings glory to God. Now with preservation, I think of the story with Abraham and Lot, when God comes to Abraham and tells him he's gonna destroy the city of Sodom, and Abraham prays for the city. He says, if there's just 10 righteous people, will you destroy the wicked with the righteous? And God says, no, if I can find 10, I won't destroy the city. Long story short, he only finds one, namely Lot, and so the city is destroyed. But I think we're working with some similar ideas in that when the people of God are practicing the Sermon on the Mount, we're actually preserving the planet from coming under God's judgment. Um, there's a lot to be said with that, and there's a lot of nuance, and I think that's okay. But I wanna try to keep these videos on the Sermon on the Mount short. Um, what we see here with these two different ideas, I think is a good interpretive principle for the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. We want to be able to see the nuance and the, the kind of fluidity that Jesus talks with. Um, basically, we don't want to think that there's only one way to interpret the things that Jesus is saying. I think that he wants us to see, the, again, the nuances and the flavors and the angles of everything that he's saying. There's not just one way to interpret this, um, even though there might be wrong ways. Um, moving on to the people of God as light, Jesus calls us a city on a hill. And I think immediately we should be thinking of the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is the place where God dwelled and the place where he set his covenant, the place where, where God lives. Uh, and so when Jesus says that we're a city on the hill, he's essentially saying that his people, the community that Jesus is creating is Jerusalem. We are the place where God lives. We are the place where God, um, where God dwells. We are the place where God is worshiped. We are the place where God is glorified. And the church is the community in which the covenant with God is found. Um, now, I think also with, with comparing us to light, because Jesus says you can't, people don't light a candle just to put it under a basket or a lamp, just to put it under a basket, but we put a lamp on a table or on a stand so that its light can be seen by the whole house. I think in saying that Jesus is communicating that it's actually not enough to be Christian in name only. It's not enough just to say that we believe in Jesus or that we have faith. And I think this is what James is tapping into in James 2.18 when he says that, like, oh, you say um, you have faith without works, but I will show you my faith by my works and faith without works is dead. There is a very close relationship between, and by close, I, I mean inseparable relationship between faith and works, be between faith and deeds. Remember, last week we said that the word for faith in Greek actually means faith in the way that we normally think of it and faithfulness. And so the, the works or the deeds 
of the Sermon on the Mount are actually the way that we keep faith with Jesus. And so to be a city on a hill or to be a light means that our actions are on display for the world and for God. It's not enough to be a Christian in name only, but we actually have to practice the Sermon on the Mount. This is the process of repentance. Um, to live in an unholy or an unjust way is to participate in the unholiness and the injustice of society. And that actually makes us not Christian. And so if we're going to name ourselves as Christians, but not practice holiness or not practice ju justice, both of those together, then we might as well, we might as well not even call ourselves Christians because we are like salt that has lost its flavor. So if we don't have holiness, if we don't have works of justice, then we actually don't have Christianity. And I, that's a really intense statement. But I think it's an intensity that Jesus wants us to feel. Um, and I think uh, an intensity that Jesus wants to weigh in our hearts. This is what he says um, later on in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will be, will be entering into the kingdom of heaven, um, but only those who do the will of the Father. Um, so like that's again that's introductory but this is Jesus setting up the Sermon on the Mount like what we're being given in the Sermon on the Mount is a lifestyle but it's something to be taken seriously this is the way that God's people are identified both by the world and I think by God this is the way that we show the world God's good life because in the community that Jesus is creating we find both holiness and we find justice. We find morality and we find works of justice. We find people who are saying no to things like anger and lust, but we're also finding the community where people are saying yes to caring for the poor, the ostracized, and, and really the victims of society. So moving on, Jesus says, in Matthew 5, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this might actually be the most confusing or most challenging part of the sermon because we don't think we, we as Christians, we don't normally think of ourselves as keeping the law. Um, but here Jesus is telling us he actually hasn't come to abolish. He hasn't come to get rid of the law, but to fulfill it. And so what does that mean for Christians? Um, I think that what Jesus is doing here in the sermon is he's actually teaching his people how to keep Torah. I think it's important to understand that the word Torah in Hebrew actually just means instruction. It doesn't mean law. And so when, when Jesus is saying he hasn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, what he's saying is that he hasn't come to abolish God's instruction or the prophets. And so it's imperative that we see both Torah and the Sermon on the Mount, not as law, but as Jesus's instruction on how to live God's good life. Um, it is wisdom for the people of God. But I think this is precisely why the Sermon on the Mount has to be taken seriously, because it's not a law which we can just do away with because we're incapable of keeping it. This is how Luther interpreted the Sermon on the Mount, and I think he was wrong. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is to be taken seriously precisely because it is the way of God, is the way of God's kingdom, and it's the wisdom that Jesus is giving to us to live as citizens of that kingdom. If we're going to call ourselves disciples of Jesus, then we have to be discipled by Jesus. We have to come, come under his discipline. Um, and this is what I think Jesus means when he's saying he hasn't come to abolish law and the prophets. 
because he's what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount is teaching us what the law meant all along. Um, what God's instruction, what God's covenant, what Torah means all along. Um, there's a temptation to either turn the Sermon on the Mount into these black and white statements, again, that are impossible to keep, um, or to look at them more as suggestions. And those are both pitfalls. They're pitfalls on either side of the road, and we have to do our best to avoid both of those pitfalls. Now, when Jesus talks about a person who breaks the law or who keeps the law, um, I think he's talking about the sermon. Uh, when he says, whoever um, breaks one of the least of these commandments or keeps one of the least of these commandments, I think these commandments is actually talking about the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think he's talking about the the laws or the instructions found in Exodus or Leviticus. I think he's talking about what he's giving here in the sermon. Um, and so we see that when Jesus says keeping, when Jesus talks about keeping the commandments, he's talking about keeping what he's giving in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, this is the way that as disciples of Jesus, we keep Torah. So we're not really looking at Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to give us our instructions. As much as we, as again, as disciples of Jesus, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount to give us instruction. But by keeping Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we end up keeping what's written in the five books of Moses. Um, because God's character is given to us in the Sermon on the Mount and in Torah. And so what we find is that as we begin to embody the Sermon on the Mount, we are participating in the story that God has been telling since the book of Genesis. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, I think that's a good way to look at what Jesus is doing, both in this statement specifically, but then in the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. Uh, this is just the way that we follow Jesus. I think I could say it that way. Um, now we come to the last thing for our section today. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does that mean? What exactly is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? And how do we make sure that, we, um, that our righteousness exceeds it? Again, I think it's better to interpret, at least in the Sermon on the Mount, maybe Matthew as a whole. I think it's best to interpret the word righteousness as justice. So Jesus is saying, unless your justice exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the book of Matthew portrays Jesus as like the culmination of the line of the prophets. Jesus is the, the last word to be said that begins with Moses and goes on through the Old Testament um, and it ends with Jesus as the last, the ultimate, the best prophet because he is the son of God. Throughout the prophets, what we see is that the prophets are challenging God's people for two basic things. One, idolatry. And two, injustice. Um, and what we see happening with the Pharisees is that even though they're not like committing idolatry in the the normal sense of the word they've actually given their allegiance over to rome we see this throughout the gospels where the pharisees are kind of in cahoots they're a little bitter about it they're grumpy about it but they're kind of in cahoots with the roman system um and they we see also that they are they are oppressing the poor um, that they see the poor and the marginalized as these second class citizens in god's kingdom and because they are against the people that Jesus wants to bring into the center of God's kingdom, what they find is they're actually against Jesus, and therefore they're, they're against God. So in order for our righteousness to exceed, or our justice to exceed that of the, the scribes and the Pharisees, what Jesus is exhorting us to do is not to just be people of high or godly morals, but also to be people who practice justice, people who are working for the good of those who are victims of society. 
as followers of Jesus, we actually have to carry these two things. We have to carry them hand in hand. We cannot sacrifice morale, like godly morality for acts of justice, nor should we sacrifice acts of justice for morality. As Christians, we actually don't have to choose between the two. And in fact, we're exhorted and um, obligated to practice both. We have to be both people of justice and people of holiness. And I think for those of us who live in the United States, we're torn between those two. And we think we have to, because of the political parties, that we have to be either people of um, holiness or we have to be people of justice. And what Jesus is calling us to, the kind of righteousness that Jesus is calling us to, actually exceeds that. The Sermon on the Mount, when it's practiced, when it's embodied, will always put us at odds with the, the powers, uh, the powers that be, whether those are political powers or spiritual powers. Because by embodying the Sermon on the Mount, we are embodying the life of God. And that puts us um, in, um, that puts us in a place of confrontation with the systems of the world and with the powers of the spiritual powers of the air because God's kingdom is against the kingdoms of the world and God's kingdom is against the kingdoms of the spiritual world. And so by, again, by embodying the Sermon on the Mount, we place ourselves at odds with both of those systems. Um, and so what do we expect except persecution or, or um, um, resistance at, at some level? Um, so yeah, that's it for today. Again, I hope this is helpful and encouraging. I hope that it's enlightening as you read through the Sermon on the Mount. This one went a little bit longer than I would have liked, but here we are. Um, again, if you like the video, hit like, hit the bell, hit subscribe, and please, if, if you find these helpful, share this with your friends. And I will see you next week.